Yeah, and we're going to start off with uh, Philippa Easterbrook. Philippa's worked globally. She's worked in the US, United Kingdom, including at my unit, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and is presently at the WHO. And Philippa's going to talk on integrated, decentralized guidelines for care. Thank you, Mark, and good morning, everybody. So in this presentation, I I'm going to take you through um, the rationale for these updated hepatitis C guidelines um, on simplified service delivery, decentralization, integration, task shifting, a little bit about our new recommendations on point of care diagnostics that I've made reference to in a couple of the uh, discussions we've had, and also the addition of treatment of adolescents and children. So I'll be super quick, summarize the recommendations, the evidence summary and the rationale, and then implementation considerations. And these are the products that, uh, that we have. Nobody prints things anymore, so these are really limited edition um, and all, all we have. Um, but a policy brief for the uh, simplified service delivery, and then one on the treatment of children and adolescents, and then the, uh, the full guidelines and the, the web annexes. Uh, and also a QR code there. So uh, this slide has been shown several times in, uh, over the course of the last uh, couple of days with the original ambitious targets for elimination of viral hepatitis as a public health threat. And that was defined in 2016 when this was launched at the time of the first global health sector strategy for viral hepatitis in 2016 as a 90% reduction in incidence of new infections, that's both hepatitis B and C, and a 65% reduction in mortality. And that was uh, also integrated with some modeling work that demonstrated that these impact targets could be achieved through the scale up of six synergistic preventative as well as testing and treatment interventions. And so I've just highlighted in blue the very important testing and treatment uh, targets, which were that to achieve those impact targets, you would need to have diagnosed 90% of those infected and to have treated 80% of those diagnosed and eligible. But in 2019, well, this was the, the global report was published in, in 2021, um, but based on 2019 data, so as of 2019, um, still, as shown on the bars, um, the green bar is uh, those who were diagnosed of those infected and the yellow, those treated of those infected we still were faced with only 21% of the 58 million uh, hep C infected diagnosed and 13% treated. Um, uh, but since the original uh, cascade estimates, around 10 million had been treated. So overall, the burden had decreased from 71 million with chronic viremic infection. Um, in 2015 to 58 million in 2019. But the important message is there remained a major testing and treatment gap. And therefore, the imperative to simplify uh, the treatment uh, and care path pathway. So just as over a 15 year or so period with HIV, we had a progressive evolution and simplification of the, uh, the guidelines, the ARV guidelines. So we have had over a more compressed time period with uh, hepatitis C. So with three iterations of the uh, hepatitis C guidelines, um, uh, a total of four with the 2022, with the move in 2018 to a, to a treat all the use of pangenotypic regimens, the dispensing of the need for the um, uh, interferon, um, and the simplification from around 10 uh, DEA options down to three, the soft DAC, the soft VEL, and the, the GP. 
And in addition, um, the migration to a lower age uh, threshold for treatment, uh, initially down to 12 years, so including the adolescents in 2018, um, but now in 2022, down to three years of, of age. And then finally, on the service delivery in 2018, we had uh, included eight, eight good practice principles for simplified service delivery, very much modelled on the HIV approach um, uh, and shown in the, the box on the right. And in 2022, highlighting and migrating to formal evidence-based recommendations, three of those good practice principles, the decentralisation, integration and task shifting. So this is just a reminder of some of the distinctive features of WHO guidelines uh, and how they differ from other professional society guidelines. So the emphasis, but not to the exclusion, on low and middle income countries across a range of epidemic profiles, our tar targeted audience, including national program managers, as well as the treating clinicians, and the adoption of the public health approach, which you've heard so much about, with simplified and standardized approaches and preferred regimens, rather than a more individualized treatment uh, approach. And very much the consideration of all aspects, the feasibility, the equity, end user acceptability. And this has come up quite a bit in the discussions in relation to hepatitis B. And again, I, I think it's quite helpful to just uh, profile the main steps we take in the WHO guidelines, starting with identification of the topic, formulation of the PICO question, population intervention comparison, and main outcomes, and then the commissioning of the systematic review on the basis of that very defined question. And then in the process of formulating the recommendations, the consideration of not just the evidence base, but an overall assessment of the benefits and, and the harms, um, considerations of resource use, cost effectiveness, and then we often undertake a series of surveys, both in, with the end users and the community, as well as among healthcare providers, to have that real 360 degree assessment um, in the formulation of the recommendations. And all that is mapped on an evidence to decision table. And then that then moves to whether the recommendation based on the grade methodology is strong or conditional. Um, and the grading of the quality of evidence, high, moderate, low, very low. So what were the simplified service delivery recommendations? Well, the main message is really moving the treatment and care out of the specialty clinics. And I think very much that is now understood, accepted and, and, and recognised in the hepatology community and the imperative of doing this, particularly in high burden hep C settings. So we recommend delivery of hep C testing and treatment at peripheral health or community-based facilities and ideally at the same site. And that's a really important message supported by the evidence. And these facilities could be primary care, harm reduction, prisons, HIV, ART clinics, as well as community-based organisations. And linked to that recommendation of decentralisation is to integrate the hepatitis C testing and treatment with existing services at those sites. And that particularly includes harm reduction. And then on the task sharing, recommending that uh, um, the delivery of testing, care and treatment by trained non-specialist doctors and nurses to expand access. And all these were strong recommendations based on moderate certainty of evidence. So the overall rationale for this was a very large systematic review, 142 uh, studies, around 15% low and middle income countries, so rather less. Um, comparing full decentralization, that's testing and treatment at the same decentralized site, compared to partial testing at the decentralized site and treatment elsewhere, or no decentralization, and comparing <coughs> specialist delivered versus non-specialist. And the main finding was increased uptake of viral load, linkage to care, and treatment with the full decentralization in particular. And there were comparable cure rates between decentralized, non-decentralized, and 
non-specialist and specialist. And a, a strong support based on three surveys we undertake, undertook uh, from the community for fully decentralized and integrated services. So services near to their home. And clearly many implementation considerations, but all these recommendations need adaptation to the local and the national context. Um, and indeed decentralization may not be appropriate in all settings, particularly high income settings and the need for appropriate training for task sharing. And I just wanted to highlight this differentiated care needs. This is the approach that was adopted with HIV and we very much adapted this. And this was in the 2018 guidelines. So specifying the who, what type of category of, of, of patient, uh, what their care needs might be, where and by whom. And I think this applies equally to hepatitis C and can be adapted to hepatitis B, but really helps plan services that those who are stable and uh, can be treated and monitored entirely at the decentralized site and those who need more input. And this is just in terms of facilitating the task sharing, a range of excellent um, uh, modules and online training packages that are available for training healthcare workers that can then be complemented by tele-mentorship or on-site mentorship uh, by those experienced. Um, and uh, this is work we did with the University of Washington to map all these training opportunities. So moving quickly to the recommendations on the diagnostic side in the blue are what we had in our original hepatitis testing guidelines, the who to test, the how to test, confirmation of hep C viremia using lab-based quantitative or qualitative nucleic acid testing or core antigen, and then strategies to promote uptake and linkage, use of DBS, on-site RDT, um, and integrated testing. And on the right, we have what's the update. Um, 2021, we issued hepatitis C self-testing guidelines as another strategy to promote access. And now in 2022, we included point of care uh, viral load as an additional or optional strategy for um, uh, accessing viral load for both detection of the viremia as well as test of cure. And we also included new manufacturers protocols for the use of dry blood spots. So these were the recommendations. Importantly, the point of care viral load for both diagnosis and test of cure. And a, another recommendation, which really was a very common sense practical recommendation of reflex viral load testing. And this can apply equally to hepatitis B. So this is, can either be delivered through lab-based reflex, reflex testing, where in the lab you have a positive hep C antibody EIA, you use the same sample or a duplicate sample to immediately uh, uh, transition to doing a viral load. Similarly, in a clinic setting, so-called clinic-based reflex testing, positive RDT, you immediately take another sample, either finger stick, if it's for a finger stick uh, point of care, or another vena, uh, a vena puncture, uh, and immediately send for viral load. This just simplifies and shortens the pathway. Rationale here was based on, and the evidence base, 45 studies, compared point of care RNA assays with uh, lab-based assays, shorten the turnaround time to treatment initiation, increase viral load uptake and treatment uptake. And another systematic review showed very high sensitivity and specificity of these point of care assays. Clear benefits, these platforms can be placed in lower level health facilities where the patient's receiving care and there's an opportunity for multi-disease integration, be it uh, HIV, TB, HPV, um, using the same platform and COVID. And for reflex testing, again, another systematic review, 51 studies comparing using lab-based reflex or 19 clinic-based increase the uptake of viral load and improve linkage. And this really does simplify the care pathway, avoids the need for additional visits, avoids the need for 
additional blood draws, particularly among persons who inject drugs, cost saving, and we know it's feasible to implement. The lab-based reflex testing has been widely implemented in many high-income countries, and indeed also the clinic-based reflex testing. Um, the World Hepatitis Alliance with Coalition Plus in collaboration with WHO uh, undertook a comprehensive um, community-based survey, uh, 50 countries, with some very clear messages um, about uh, their views on um, simplified service delivery. So uh, the, the wish to have the viral load confirmation in community uh, settings or primary care and a really strong message about access to initial and confirmatory viral on the same day and really ideally in the same place and to start treatment on the same day um, and in the same place. Um, not surprising, um, really, the need and the wish for convenient uh, services. Again, national programs need to think strategically about the right place to place the point of care platforms and how this will integrate into existing uh, uh, national reference uh, lab-based testing. And really best place, particularly in settings like harm reduction sites uh, where patient populations higher risk to, to loss to follow up. And the boutique and optimal is to place where there's going to be a one-stop test and treat everything on the same site and the opportunities for uh, integrated multi-disease testing. And finally, the recommendations on treating children and adolescents. Manal has spoken very eloquently about this. Where there's an estimated 3.2 million children and adolescents with chronic hep C infection. Uh, the burden is largely 80% of the burden in about 20 countries. Um, and the importance of extending treatment options to children and adolescents. So now for the first time, we have um, the same recommendations and DEA regimens used in adults uh, are now extended to children down to the age of three years. That's the SOFL, the SOFDAC, and the, uh, and the GP. Um, and this was based again on a systematic review, comprehensively seen high SVR rates across all age groups and all regimens, no serious adverse events or dis uh, discontinuations at a low rate, and the opportunity to achieve a cure before the onset of disease progression. Um, we have DA regimens, SOFL, uh, GP and soft lead that have got regulatory approval. And with soft DAC, there was a lack of direct evidence on clinical efficacy and side effects in uh, young children. It was based on key, key PK modeling and that we could use the adult dose down to 25 kilograms and below that age, half the adult dose. And again, strong support from the, um, from the healthcare worker survey for the treatment of children, but recognizing some of the challenges, not yet in national policies, um, lack of health worker uh, awareness and lack of uh, community awareness now of the opportunity to treat uh, children. Implementation considerations, case finding as always is absolutely key. And really for, 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 for countries to now uh, systematically be reaching out and testing all the children of known hep C positive uh, parents and mothers um, in order to case find. And the need for uh, adolescent friendly services as we've experienced for HIV. So next steps for elimination, we need this paradigm shift in service delivery. Case finding is, is, is key um, and the need to adopt in a, in a very nimble way some of these diagnostic innovations with strategic placement. Um, and I think as has been highlighted, the need for uh, focusing on the financing and the improvements in data collection. And just to acknowledge the many people who contributed to the guidelines process, and we're now marching on to do the same for hepatitis B. Thank you. Thank you.